In the wake of Thomas Edison's invention of the truly sustainable light bulb back in 1879, the homes and businesses of America began to hum with electricity. But this was mostly in the cities. Out in rural America, things remained much as they always had. With night came the dark. It was as simple as that. In Southern Nevada, this was the truth of living well into the 1950s, even though most of the nation's heartland had been electrified by then. But here, in the areas of Pahrump, Sandy Valley, Amargosa Valley, Beatty, and Fish Lake, life was different. For much of the nation's history, the remote deserts of Southern Nevada were largely uninhabited. Also, many small hardscrabble communities had been born and died as mining operations and other commercial efforts waxed and waned. Sandy Valley, for example, had seen multiple settlements come and go since it was first settled in the 1870s. But following the Federal Homestead Act and Desert Entry Project and its promise of 160 acres to whomever could farm the land successfully, a wave of settlers came and changed Nevada forever. One of those early homesteaders was Ken Gary. Beer land management would allow desert entrymen, they call them, 160 acres. The uh, filing fee was something like $2.50 and if they proved up on their land, showed that it was viable for agriculture, they had to grow a crop, harvest it, sell it, then they got their patent and the, the land was theirs. Some of them sought work at the uh, Nevada Test site, which was where I worked. Then they farmed at night, which is much easier. You can irrigate a lot better at night and weekends. And then, uh, little by little, why more people settled here for the jobs and the opportunity to get away from uh, Las Vegas. Sheila Rao remembers those early days, too. I moved here in 1956. I was a freshman in high school, and my parents came here uh, with a farming venture. And I came because they said I would. There were six families here, totally. There was no electricity, there were no roads. I moved here in 1951. I was 19 years old. I was married, had a child born three weeks later, and there was no roads. Uh, gravel road out north, it was 110 miles to Las Vegas, mostly over rocks. So it was pretty primitive. I didn't have electricity until I was about 15 years old. We always lived down there along the river, in the little shacks down there. Nobody had any power, water, anything. Life without power was a challenge, a challenge these new settlers undertook with the same grit and determination that would come to define the communities of rural southern Nevada. Some people had generators and of course you serviced them, you started them, uh, normally did not run them 24 hours a day, more uh, during the heat of the day in the summer or towards evenings more if when you needed the lights and stuff inside. I mean, literally 1800 sort of style living and a lot of the water because they didn't have the pressure systems and things that require electricity were tanks. And this was like in 19, almost 1960, it was still like that. So it was primitive. <laughs> I lived in a little house trailer with no bathroom. It took us probably three or four years before we bought an old army surplus generator, an Onan, as I recall. And um, we used that, it was propane uh, powered, and we used that for several years until we became a little more affluent. And then we got a uh, diesel engine powered uh, electric generator and had 24 hour power then, really living.
it's kind of hard to explain hardships if you just go back and 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 read anything of people that that farmed or did anything prior to electricity or anything like that. We built our house with the help of our neighbors. You used a handsaw because you had no electricity. All I can say is what an improvement, you know, what a godsend. Not having electricity, I didn't realize it was as hard on mom and dad, probably, because mom would have to cook on a wood stove and, and um, ultimately my dad he thought that it would be a great way for us to have baths by running a, a hose all the way from uh, a spigot at the pump and let the sun heat the water in it and string it up through the, wind sh the window of a, a little tiny room. And Without power of any kind, it, uh, it, it's hard to imagine nowadays. You have computers, you have refrigerators, you have stoves. Uh, your stove was a wood stove. Uh, anything you had to keep cold, everybody would line up at my grandfather's store when he got like meat in or what have you. For dry eyes, try and keep their stuff cold as long as possible. They went to bed in the dark and got up when it was light. They didn't, they didn't, most of them didn't have electricity of any kind. They were just hard working individuals trying to get the patent on their land. That was foremost, and then sell it and either expand or move, move out. The coming of Valley Electric Association changed all that. There were no AC units in Beatty before Valley Electric came online, you know, from, you know, the, the distributed power. A lot of people before that had propane refrigerators. And they work good, except for in the summertime, they don't work real well. But it was better than nothing. It was um, sitting down at a table with a kerosene lamp and, and hoping that, you know, you could read your book um, to get enough light. And of course, it was always kind of like subdued lighting. Even as a kid, it wasn't bright lighting like what we have right now. These new settlers did more than build farms and homesteads. They built a way of life, and with it, a community. I might remind you that when I first moved out here, I was 19, I couldn't get a hamburger and a milkshake. And I really liked, I really wanted a hamburger and a milkshake. To get a community going, that was the big thing, because if your pickup broke down, you couldn't buy a tire or a generator or a fan belt out here. You'd get on the farm tractor and drive to your nearest neighbor, which may be a mile, and ask if he know anybody going to Las Vegas. So they, you know, in the meantime, you're disabled. We wanted growth. I, I, I wanted growth so that we could have some of those things. And that growth would come from Valley Electric Association. In a way, powering Southern Nevada began back in 1914 in Parkland, Washington. That year marked the founding of the first co-op in the United States. Parkland Light and Water was built from the ground up by homeowner volunteers, early settlers who were mostly from Scandinavia, where co-ops were common. They brought this concept of an autonomous association of people who voluntarily cooperate for their mutual social, economic, and cultural benefit with them to America, and with it, the ability for rural individuals to put the power of electricity in their own hands. Later, but still before many homesteaders started fledgling farms and ranches in Pahrump, Amargosa, Beatty, Sandy Valley, and Fish Lake Valley, more help would come from faraway Washington, D.C. In 1935, during the height of the Depression, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was looking for a way to create jobs and help modernize rural America. At the time, 90% of people in American cities had power, but in the country, only 10% of homes were electrified. The president's solution was the Rural Electrification Administration, or the REA as it came to be known. The REA's mission was simple, provide low-cost loans for equipment to utilities, local governments, and co-ops so they could connect those in the dark with the electricity they needed. I'm a 
great proponent of REA. I consider it the greatest thing this country ever did. It helped more people uh, get electricity, changed their lifestyle, uh, made life a lot easier. The biggest thing about REA, when they finance a project, they insist on area coverage. Now that means that that ranch out there six miles gets power. Anybody else take a look at building six miles for one customer? Nah. By 1936, linemen and engineers were hard at work building transmission lines and designing grids far into America's heartland. However, long before power would come to the desert, a different kind of fight would make it harder to bring electricity to America's remote areas. With the Second World War came shortages that made rural electrification difficult. With so many resources needed for the war effort, there was a lot less material available for the miles and miles of wires and cables needed to power remote communities back home. To help solve this problem, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, or NRECA, was formed. NRECA helped by securing materials, providing valuable insurance coverage for new cooperatives, and acting as an advocate and problem solver for its members. Now, with viable early co-ops established and thriving, and the help of the REA and NRECA, all the pieces began to fall into place for rural Southern Nevada. Power was finally within reach, and the movement to secure it began when the communities of Pahrump, Fish Lake, Amargosa Valley, Sandy Valley, and Beatty established a partnership with the California settlements of Tacopa and Shoshone. It started with three different efforts, the Pahrump Utility Company, the Amargosa Valley Co-op, and the White Mountain Power Cooperative. We put in $10 each to become a member of what was then Pahrump utility company, just a loose group, and with the intent of, of applying to REA for a loan to build a power system out here. We talked to Nevada Power about them moving out here. They didn't see the economics of it, and, I, and, and they were probably true, but anyway, Amargosa Valley was doing the same thing at the same time, Amargosa Valley Co-op. REA kind of got us together and said, if you'll come together under one company, it makes more economic sense and so we evolved into Amargosa Valley Power Co-op. Got a loan to build electricity into the two areas. And that was big, that was big. Even though the scene was set for electrification, it didn't take long for the fledgling co-op to run into roadblocks. Often larger utilities would be given the right to provide power, then attempt to quash the smaller co-ops. Immediately after co-ops were founded for Tacopa and Shoshone, California Edison, the leading power company in that state, was authorized by the California Public Utilities Commission to provide power to the area. The Amargosa Valley Co-op also ran into similar challenges. They approached the much larger and established Nevada Power to help bring electricity to their area, but Nevada Power refused. Then, in a practice all too common during the time, the larger utility tried to prevent the young co-op from taking root by building a spite line. To begin building lines and serving rural areas, young co-ops often had to secure loans from the REA, and to be approved for the funding, they had to show there was a need for power in the area that was not being met. The larger utilities would build the bare minimum of a line, a spite line, out to the young co-op's service territory in order to make it look as if they were going to supply power to the area when in fact, they had no plans of building out the system and serving all the people in the area. In this case, Nevada Power ran a single line out near Amargosa Valley, far enough so that it would be difficult for the young co-op to demonstrate a need to the REA, but not far enough for the line to be of any use. Ken Gary ran into the problems posed by spite lining firsthand. I'd signed up for a connection, and they said, we'll be out next week and energize you. My neighbor up here had a little trader had one light bulb in it. He was connected. <laughs> and actually when they energized the lines, nobody had light bulbs. He had the only light bulb, was probably 20 years old in this old ratty trailer. And they called that, well, they took pictures of the first light in Amagosa. 
But even after he made repeated requests, Nevada Power Company never came out to energize his home. After a while, Gary decided to hook his home up according to the standards of the Rural Electrification Association instead of Nevada Power. We weren't developed here well enough to move our trailer down, so we parked it in uh, Lathrop Wells. And I'd work down here at night. My wife would see the light go out. She'd start dinner. She'd know I'd be on my way home. Homesteaders like Ken Gary were resourceful enough to work around Nevada Power. But this was the Battleborn State, and the people here did not shy away from a fight. In a classic David versus Goliath move, the co-op fought back and brought legal action against Nevada Power. The judge ruled in their favor, and the Amargosa Valley Cooperative ended up purchasing the spite line from Nevada Power for 30 cents on the dollar. After that, the momentum began to build the young cooperative was authorized to wheel power to the Nevada test site, and the Department of the Interior also allocated key portions of hydroelectric power to Amargosa Valley. In 1951, the White Mountain Power Cooperative had begun to form. They needed a loan from the REA. But to do so, they were told they had to connect with California Power on the opposite side of the White Mountains. One of the co-op's founders was Angela Williams. They did have a line that came through at the south end of the valley, but we need to find out whether or not they would provide power for us. And their, their answer was no that they wouldn't provide power. Showing the same fighting spirit that fueled the citizens of Amargosa, the people of White Mountain didn't quit. They found a lawyer from Goldfield, Nevada, who agreed to help. With time, a meeting was arranged with an REA representative from Salt Lake City, and the young co-op was given the go-ahead for a loan. The young co-op was a pioneer in more ways than one. We all met at the uh, Dorcas Women's Club for the meetings and then this one year it was going to be an election meeting for a new director and during that meeting I was nominated for director of the White Mountain Power and I really truly thought somebody was just playing a joke I thought, are you kidding? At that moment, Angela Williams made history as the first woman to ever serve on the board of an REA co-op. Meanwhile, in Beatty, power had come to the community in the form of private business, thanks to four Caterpillar generators run by the Revert family, who provided electricity to residents as the Revert Power Company. Rick Johnson moved to small town Beatty with his family when he was 12. The Revert family provided a, a, a great, um, they were a great blessing to the city when they, brought, when they brought the power in. That was before my time, but they are the ones that brought power, electrical power, to Beatty to begin with. The power was welcome, but it wasn't easy. The Revert Power Company consisted of four Caterpillar generators and power poles that had been cut down from an abandoned telegraph line. As a child, Bobby Revert remembers the challenges of the family business. They were great big, huge caterpillar generators. And they, um, of course, needed maintenance daily. We had a fuel business at the same time. We had a service station. So diesel fuel wasn't a big object for the generators. We were happy to see uh, Valley Electric. <laughs> come to town, I'll tell you the truth. It was just more work than it was, very little profit. It was a small town, so everyone knew the reverts, including one of the sons, Steve. Rick Johnson was one of his classmates. We would be sitting in school, and it was kind of, probably wasn't fair to Steve, but the power would go out. You know, it, the, the classroom would go dark. Everything would go dark and you just had the windows. And so we would uh, turn to Steve and tell him, 
and we'd rib him and say, Steve, you forgot to feed the squirrels again this morning. Go down there and feed the squirrels, get the power on back on. By 1963, the joint Pahrump and Amargosa Valley communities, operating as Amargosa Valley Co-op, were awarded a $3.94 million loan to build a 138 kilovolt transmission line that connected Henderson, Pahrump, Amargosa, and Beatty. A few years later, in 1965, Amargosa Valley Co-op purchased Revert Power in Beatty. A partnership was also forged with White Mountain Power Cooperative. It began at a co-op meeting, when leaders from different service areas got together to discuss co-op business, when somebody stood up and suggested bringing the co-ops together. Out of the hard work and determination of small communities scattered across deserts and valleys, something big and unified was being born. So then, at the same time, at one of these meetings, uh, this director brought up that we should change the name. And we all agreed that, yeah, we can all come up with something that would serve all our valleys, all three valleys. And um, uh, he thought we should name it Valley Electric Association. The year was 1965, and soon, life in rural southern Nevada would never be the same. Though the people living in these remote valleys had had access to power, a unified co-op enabled more people to enjoy access to more reliable electricity. The day that they switched over, it was, it was a great day for Beatty. With electricity, it provided a lot more opportunity to um, do the things that were so laborious when you had to do it by hand. Going from wood stoves and stuff, electricity was really good because then we had lights and electric heaters and all that. We were pretty happy with it, because living all those years without anything. It was pretty nice. Well, the electricity, of course, changed, changed their whole lifestyle. Ultimately, it was Valley Electric Association that lit up the dark. Hollis Harris moved to Pahrump in 1963, so he saw the changes firsthand. This valley would not be what it is today without them. Uh, you know, they came in here and they built lines to different places in the valley where there was only one house on the end of it. And then when we got power, we started attracting workers from the test site, uh, workers at uh, Dodef Valley and uh, the mines and so on. We grew alfalfa, sugar beets, lettuce, Sudan grass, we did it all. Thank goodness that our, our rates were cheap enough that we could afford to keep pumping. Now that the struggle of establishing a unified co-op was complete, the hard work of building and growing it began. There were homes to connect, progress to be made, and communities to grow. And uh, when they became uh, Valley Electric out of Pahrump, things really changed a lot then. They had modern trucks, they had everything they needed to service their lines. Power outages became nil. It was a whole different world with Valley Electric. Originally, the co-op was headquartered outside of the community it served. We had a, a, uh, an office in Las Vegas, 1818 Industrial Road. That was the headquarters, and it made good sense because your manager and, and visitors and stuff had a place to go. If, if you'd come to Prump in, uh, in those days, there was no place out here to have an office. For 16 years, Valley Electric used its Las Vegas office as its home base. In time, it became clear that the co-op's main office needed to be closer to the people it served. The growing area was finally ready for it. So in 1981, Valley Electric moved its headquarters to Pahrump, and while it made many things easier, the new location did have its challenges. One of the biggest problems we had when we went to hire a, a manager, a general manager, we'd bring the wife out first and show her around. And 
if she didn't like it, we didn't interview any further on that manager. Technology drove many of the changes of the early co-op. Roy Bell started working with VEA in 1973, and he's seen the changes for himself. In the early days, we didn't have much technology. The breakers that we had would operate on a fault, but we had no indication that they did or didn't operate except by customer phone calls. So when a customer would call, we would go to that customer's locale and work our way back toward the substation to investigate what, how big the outage might be or what might be actually tripped open. Now we have various layers of technology where if a customer calls in with an outage, we can check their meter in a matter of seconds and see if it is or isn't on. We can check the meters around them very quickly and the software that we have uh, will predict for us what device, what fuse, what transformer, what breaker might be open so we can very quickly send the crew to that locale and start searching for what might be the problem rather than starting at the phone call and working our way back. Ken Steeb began working with VEA in 1979. He remembers the early days too. It definitely shortened any outages they had because we had you know, transmission voltage and substations for them. Uh, definitely made things a lot more convenient for those outlying areas. Things were challenging for team members who worked out in the field too. Danny Rogers has worked with the co-op since 1980. We still do the same thing, but we didn't have the equipment we had back then. We hauled poles on an old A-frame boom truck, and uh, we had an old highway digger, 1966 Chevy, and didn't have all the conveniences on it like the new trucks do now. And we climbed everything. First 10 years I worked here, we had no bug truck. The only bug truck we had was Imperomp, and it was for hot sets or working at 138 line, and it very seldom left the, the yard there unless we needed it. Bob Eastman started with the co-op back in 1977. We didn't have air conditioning in the truck until, I think, 82 or 85, one or the other. Yeah, yeah. And all these trucks are air conditioned. <laughs> uh, it was a little warm in the summer. Yeah. And Carl Kauke began his career with VEA in 1987. We had six linemen in the Perm office. We had two in Amargosa, one in Beatty, and two in Fish Lake. Now we've got two in all our outlying areas, plus Sandy Valley's got two, and I think we have 14 linemen in the Prump Yard now. So yeah, we've grown a lot. One major change in how linemen worked was climbing utility poles, an aspect of the job that defined the role for decades. When I started here, we, we climbed every day. You were digging and setting and framing, you know, I mean, and climbing poles every day. And you just take your hooks out, first thing to put on, because you need to make sure that they're on right and they're, they're fitting right. And then you put on your belt and hooks, and I mean everything together. And basically, you just walk up to the pole and you start one foot after another, you know, working your way up a pole. We're doing pole change outs in, uh, it's called the Scotty Castle Line. And uh, it was 118 degrees out. And we were in rubber gloves and sleeves changing poles. And then I've worked 25 below zero in Fish Lake Valley, climbing poles, and that was quite interesting. Everything you touch is frozen. Tools will freeze on your belt. So I had a lot of fun doing it, though. With changing times, the way to get the job done changed, too. There are still co-ops out there that read meters, you know, with a power meter reader. and. We don't have to do that. It is so nice. They can sit in their operational office there in Pahrump and read a meter in Fish Lake Valley or read all the meters in Fish Lake Valley. That same science makes it possible for us to isolate and identify when we have a failure. We got a lot more staff, a lot more technology. We got the dispatch center and SCADA and our IET departments. Really just awesome. We do fiber now. We got very nice equipment and our mechanics are, they stay up on everything really well. And back in the day, we used to have the uh, safety meetings here in Beatty. Prump used to come here, Armagosa, Fish Lake Valley. Used to have the safety meetings in our little office. Now we have them in Prump and it's a two day safety meeting. That's how big we have grown. When I started here, the only communication we had were, we had our truck radios, of course, to communicate, but 
there was a phone in each substation, and Pahrump only had one substation. It had four circuits out of it, and it fed all the way down to, into Sandy Valley. There wasn't a substation there. We had the same thing in Amargosa where it actually fed all the way into Beatty. Beatty didn't have a substation. Um, we had the switchyards, but we didn't have substations in those towns when I first started here. So when you went on an outage, say if Sandy was out, you started at Prompt Sub and rode all the way down until you found the problem. And it could be hours, you know, you're, you're riding along a highway at night with a spotlight trying to find, you know, where the event occurred. Our system is so much stronger than it was at that point in time along with the ability to detect how far an outage is from a substation or from a control, the advances are amazing. And restoration time is that much faster too. So it's awesome, <laughs> it really is. One thing that hasn't changed and never will is the unforgiving Nevada landscape and the dedication it takes to provide reliable power in some of the nation's most unforgiving country. We have these mountain peaks with with repeaters and so on and so forth on them. That's been small wire, like a number four conductor, and this, they get quite a bit of snow and ice build up on them in high winds. And if it takes them lines down and poles, it's quite a challenge to get them back up in that type of weather, because you can't really get trucks to them. It's just a lot of climbing and manual labor to get it done, but we all pull together and, and do it. I mean, that's what we do. One of the most memorable was when we lost uh... 22 spans of wire due to a fire. And we got it all back up. It was up a mountain, up a canyon. And we got it back up in seven days and got the power back on to the, the place that needed the power. And uh, just the way the crews all work together, a lot of fun. No complaints, just get it done. And that's how we were. We gotta get it done, get the lights back on. The dedication of its leadership coupled with the hard-working philosophies of team members and co-op members alike, has helped VEA transform itself and the communities it serves. Probably the biggest accomplishment so far has been providing, providing power, like I said, to such a large rural area, spread out area. We don't have a lot of people per mile. We run a lot of lines just to get to a small community. With the modern era came modern advancements, along with new opportunities. With the right leadership in place, VEA has been ideally situated to maximize these opportunities, while continuing to strengthen the level of service provided to the co-op's members. The 1990s brought important changes to VEA. In June of 1995, construction began on the co-op's second transmission line, a 230 kilovolt line completed in just nine months. By the summer of 1996, power use in the co-op service area had begun to skyrocket as the area experienced a decade of growth. Through all of the growth, VEA never lost sight of its dedication to community, and the co-op worked hard to adapt to the times. Some of the changes in the mid-2000s included the creation of the Sandy Valley District in 2006 and the addition of several new initiatives, including the Marathon Water Heating and Domestic Solar Water Heating pilot programs. The Marathon Water Heating program was officially launched a year later. Under this program, members were given exclusive pricing for Marathon electric water heaters, units that were far more energy efficient than traditional water heaters. In 2009, after a successful pilot phase when 40 VEA members stepped up to try the program, the domestic solar water heating program officially came online. This initiative enabled members to harness the power of Southern Nevada's sun. VEA provided financing for their home systems. As a result, members saved up to $500 in utility costs every year and qualified for valuable federal tax credits too, all while reducing more than 3,000 pounds of CO2 annually. I see VEA's role as a leader, I think when they first started, they were more of an enabler. They brought the tools needed for businesses to start to grow and to move ahead and for individuals. But now they help actually blaze the business trails. One such trail opened up with the succession of notable contracts secured in 2012. 
This included a $4.6 million contract with the U.S. Air Force to construct new facilities for electric power and communications, a $61.6 million contract with the Nevada National Security Site was awarded to VEA as well. That same year, the co-op also signed a 50-year, $36.6 million agreement to provide electric distribution services to Creech Air Force Base. These relationships were made possible by VEA's investment in its infrastructure, including 2012's Northwest Transmission Loop Project, the largest capital expansion in the co-op's history. This ambitious project included five substations, 80 miles of transmission line, and 80 miles of fiber optic communication cable. In 2013, this robust growth drew the attention of the California Independent System Operator Corporation, or Cal ISO. The ISO is, a, is an organization that coordinates the efforts of a, of a group of power companies in California. And um, we being positioned in a really good uh, environmental area where we have a lot of solar power, uh, we thought it would be advantageous to the, to the community, to the co-op, and to the members who own the co-op to become a member of that and, and if solar generation became a reality in our area, we would be in a per perfect position to, to transport that power into California, but we didn't have a way into it. Um, the California ISO is that way into it. Board member John Maurer explains the significance of this achievement. So there was a lot of unknowns that we had to work through with the Cal ISO and you know integrating our system into their system and control wise and it was on a short time frame. That was probably what made it even more difficult was we had a short time frame we were trying to accomplish so uh, we, we put high expectations on ourselves and, and come through just in the nick of time. <laughs> the night that we flipped the switch and, and had a celebration there in Pahrump was probably one of the most memorable. With a focus on commitment to community, VEA launched its charitable foundation in 2009, followed in 2013 by Operation Roundup, a program where members can opt to round up their power bill to the nearest dollar, with the additional monies going straight to local nonprofits. These programs continue a tradition of neighbors helping neighbors. We are owned by the members of, of the community of Beatty and the members of the community of Fish Lake Valley and Sandy Valley and Pahrump uh, and Amargosa Valley. The people in those areas own this company and so we owe it to them to serve uh, civic, civic responsibilities as well as, as providing power for them. In 2012, the co-op was honored with a Community Service Award for Energy Efficiency from the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. And along the way, VEA has sought out opportunities to roll up its sleeves and strengthen the communities it serves. Well, they've helped in you know, any project the town has had as far as they could. And, you know, like the park and all that, they've helped or their trucks and stuff, you know. Basically, if you ask them, they very rarely, very rarely turn you down, you know. Valley Electric, through their solar test site that's next to the office, donates the power it produces back to Valley Electric, who in turn spreads that among the senior centers throughout their districts. We run education drives. We call, it's called Fill the Bucket Truck and it's, we're involved in that right now, uh, collecting education supplies for um, the schools in the different areas, elementary through high school. The prompt sign that you come in from Las Vegas, there was a big fountain there that hadn't been running for a long time. People came from the community, but more importantly, a lot of people came from Valley Electric, just donated their time to scrub and clean up and fix and repair and get that fountain running again. And I've, every time I drive by that, I thought, I'm proud to be a part of this organization because they provide, you know, they do things for the community. In small towns, jobs are a premium, and especially for young people. Uh, young people don't have a, it, it's just hard to get jobs here. And so they've, they've done that. Without Valley Electric, the casinos couldn't expand. So that is an important thing. 
Another thing is, is they offer scholarships. They offer internships for high school students, and, and I understand that they're, they do also for um, maybe some college students. With an eye to the future, VEA is also part of the Youth Leadership Program, or YES Camp, which teaches valuable skills to the children of VEA members. Participants team up with children from across Nevada and neighboring states for team building activities every year. Their emphasis is on leadership, developing leadership in the youth of the community. Uh, of course, you know, leadership can go anywhere when these kids leave. If they leave the community, then they take that leadership skill with them. But hopefully, some stay in the community and that skills that they develop at the YES camps, how to relate with other people, how to generate ideas, how to implement those ideas, and how to get other people involved, how to be the leaders of your community. Um, it's, it's a terrific program. The community really loves Valley Electric. We do a lot for the community, like for the BGID Park and Rec Service. We, we really helped them out. Whoever needs help, I mean, we help the community a lot, you know, with, with service panels and uh, whatever else they need. You know, they whatever they need, we do it. You know, like we have the big baby days in um, October. We spend about a week helping them prepare, help put tents up, put electrical panels out for all the vendors to plug into. And um, whatever they need, we, we're really good about helping them out. Where we used to just be the power company, tur turn on, you know, turn the switch on and have the electricity, now we are kind of a resource to the community as well, and we try to be. As VEA looks to the future, the co-op is building on a strong foundation, built by the hardworking people who illuminated the dark for early homesteaders. That can-do spirit lives on in VEA's daily operations. They are so helpful in the communities. They are a delight to me. I know I could not do my job as a director without Valley Electric employee support. They are just truly wonderful people. Yet it's a spirit of innovation that is defining the next great era. We've found ways to go uh, capitalize on other projects and, and find revenues that benefit the membership, but it didn't come from the members. Uh, that's That think outside the box, I think, is one of the biggest uh, changes that has been made at Valley Electric. True to its core, VEA continues to find ways to enable members to power the co-op they own through special initiatives like the Ambassador Program. Ambassadors are members who create a conduit between the co-op and members throughout VEA's service area. They serve on committees, oversee important community efforts, and are charged with talking to their friends and neighbors about VEA and soliciting information that can help make the co-op stronger. They have become a part of what goes on with Valley and the programs we have and needs. Uh, uh, they bring amazing ideas and they donate hours and hours of their time to help with things, uh, things with the school, our school supply drives. Uh, I really don't know what we would do without them and, and I think it would, as a board member, it would be impossible to offer them enough thanks. They are the, the fingers on the pulse of the community, or that's how we look at them. Keep us informed on what's going on keep us abreast of what's going on and bring us ideas. We're, you know, we, we're just a limited number of brains trying to, trying to solve problems. And if you can engage the whole community, then uh, that's a whole lot more brain power focused at an issue. It's those kinds of small town values that have always defined VEA and will continue to do so from the first homesteaders who came together to power the remote southern Nevada mountains, deserts, and valleys, to the people who have built their careers with the co-op, to the families who have seen their communities grow in ways they'd never imagine. VEA is about people helping people. Always has been, always will. It's just good for your heart to know you're a part of that kind of a group, and they are the largest and sustaining uh, employer in the Valley at this point. Working at a place like Valley Electric, I, I, there just aren't many places that give you that type of opportunity to learn on the job and 
and uh, get the training and knowledge that you need to do that job, it's just, it's been amazing. Well, Valley Electric's always been a good neighbor. I love VEA. VEA has uh, built my house and raised my kids, and now it's, you know, allowing me to uh, have grandkids and have a lot of fun with them. It, it's been a great career. I, I have loved working here all of these years. I've always felt that VEA was the salvation of this area. I've always felt that they were a, a well-run company. You know, 13 years on the board, naturally I would think that. It is so exciting to be a part of a growing, vibrant company that is innovative, that is interested in people, helping people, um, and, and all of those things fit together, mesh together, to make a, a wonderful working machine. And I, I'm just gratified to no end. Any door that opens, we'll look in it and see if it's, if it's a benefit to us, and, and we're willing to, to go down that road if it is, and it benefits the members, that's why we do it. The connection of power to homes, the connection of a co-op to its members, the connection of neighbors helping neighbors. Valley Electric Association has been there to make it happen, and it's meant more than bringing light to rural Nevadans. It's meant powering communities. Back then, right now, and into the future.